Hello, this is Daniel Torres. Welcome to the FMCG Guys podcast. As you can see, I'm alone today, but have a very interesting topic for you all. We're going to talk about activist shareholders, which are individuals or groups of investors who purchase a significant portion of a company's stock with the aim of influencing the company's policies and action, normally in the very short term. They've become a home staple in the business world, uh, a known player in the United States for decades. They've made a big impact in Europe in the last few years. Actually, last year, they reached their record high in Europe with 235 campaigns. And in the last few years also, these investors have made a big impact in the consumer goods industry with some memorable moments, such as, for example, 3G attacking Unilever or Nelson Peltz assaulting Procter & Gamble's board of directors. And it looks like we're just at the beginning, with some other movements happened recently at Danone or Unilever, for example. Today, I have the pleasure to introduce Ivan Cuesta, who is actually a consumer goods veteran that's worked at the likes of Danone and Hero, and has deeply studied activist shareholders' impact on companies. I recently had the pleasure to host him here at my office in Barcelona and have a conversation about activist shareholders, what they mean to the industry and what the impact they'll have and a few stories around that. Hope you enjoy the conversation as much as I did. My name is Ivan Cuesta. I'm French. Uh, I am 43 years old. Uh, My background is uh, a corporate background in the FMCG uh, sector. I've been working for Danone, for uh, Aero Group, for uh, GMK, and uh, I have as well an entrepreneurship background. I'm an entrepreneur in the the nutrition and health uh, environment. And I have as well a teaching and researcher, researching background as I am a teacher in CEDEP, in the INSEAD um, campus in Fontainebleau, as well as in uh, in Politecnico in Milan and in EADA in Barcelona. My area of um, teaching and uh, researching is about activist shoulders and uh, the impact of activist shoulders regarding governance and financial performances. Yeah, well, thanks a lot for coming to see me in the office today. Ivan, we met for coffee this morning and we decided we talked about doing a podcast before and we we thought, why not do it in person? So you're actually the second person uh, to do it in person with me after we I did it with uh, Lucia Marcuzzo from Levis um, before last year. Uh, we met in a shop talk conference and we also did it in person. So... We're going to talk about activist investors today. Maybe first of all, in case somebody doesn't know about them, what what is an activist investor? And maybe, I don't know if you're uh, familiar also with the origin of the term, which is a bit, sounds like one thing, but act like another thing in some way. Yeah, uh, it's a a very good question. When I, I started to look at this area in terms of research, I explained to my mum that I was doing research about activist shoulders. I said, ah, so you are looking at NGOs, Greenpeace, doing uh, activism against companies. I said, no, 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 no. That's not what it is about. <laughs> it's a bit the opposite. So uh, activist, uh, activist investors are hedge fund, uh, which... Uh, investment body that they call um, investment vehicle that is relatively free from uh, regulatory control. So it's mainly based in, in the US and London. They usually have less than 100 investors, so it's relatively small. It's uh, it's not a mutual fund like BlackRock, BlackRock or, or Vanguard. It's a small investment body. Uh, Really, to, to, to remember something is it's, it should not have more than 100 investors. So this is what is an activist shareholder. It's an hedge fund with less than 100 investors. Mm-hmm. So it's relatively small. Yeah. yeah. And what is, the, what is the final idea of an sh- activist shareholder? Or like what's their mission, so to speak? <laughs> Basically, it's, their mission is in their definition. So it's to invest 
uh, money. So basically, is to have uh, to gain money with their investment based on activism, based on provoking actions for improving for improving uh, performances of the company they, they target. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the, the average time an activist investor is present in the shareholding in the shareholding structure of a company is 18 months. So as part of their communication strategies, they always claim that they aim at long-term presence, long-term uh, investment in their target companies. But the reality is that on average, they don't stay more than 18 months. So to, to, to answer your question is that their objective is definitely to uh, have a mid-term uh, return on their investment, not short-term, not long-term. In their world, it's mid-term. Everybody has this world. It's short term, really. No, <laughs> when you come to think about it, um, when we can talk more about like the modus operandi, maybe later. But uh, in within FMCG, one of the main, I think, the probably the most famous, at least to me, in the last few years, the most famous activist investor has been Nelson Peltz. I think his fund is called Trine Investment, yes. right? Yes, yes. Um, but who are some of the other main players in, in activism these days that are especially relevant? So the ones who are present uh, and uh, who are the most active in, in the FMCG environment are definitely Carly Khan, but we have as well Yana Partners, Value Act Capital. Third point, uh, it's a very active one in, 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 our, in our world. Elliot as well. Uh, so these are the main ones. So you can summarize them in, in less than 10 companies. Uh, including try and fund, or obviously the the one of uh, Nelson Belt. Yeah, mm -hmm. interesting. When did they start going into fast moving consumer goods? Like, have they always been an active player in this industry, or is it something more recent? I mean, the history of activism is U.S. based. So up to 10 to 15 years ago, it was 99% uh, U.S. focus um, phenomenon. Phenomenon, yes. They have been uh, going outside the U.S. Uh, over the past 10 to 15 years, and um, they have been looking at their, also their, their, their historical area of gain was banking industry and tech companies. Mm -hmm. So it was not pretty much. They were not pretty much involved in the in the FMCG uh, sector. Uh, the one which really started is again uh, Nelson Peltz, uh, who has been going outside the US and uh, into into the FMCG environment yeah. with Danone already in 2012. Well, wow. he didn't stay more than six months. There, but you, that was the first activist event we 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 touched with our hands in in Europe, in the FMCG environment. Mm -hmm. So it's a quite recent uh, phenomenon yeah. in Europe. If you consider that in the US it exists already for more than hundred years. Well, yeah, and in the, well, interesting. Um, is there a reason why they started going into Europe, or it's just like looking for places that maybe? Yeah, I think they've been looking at uh, very attractive companies for them, and um, we we might discuss later on of what what how uh, a typical target company look like. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, it's clear that the the profile of uh, typical target companies for activists was. Uh, popping up in in, in the, the old continent, and uh, companies like Danone and later on uh, Nestle, Unilever, uh, Luxottica, uh, etc., where have been becoming attractive for these investors. Mm -hmm. And how is their modus operandi? Like, when does a an activist investor come into play? Because we've seen them, yeah. Nelson Peltz very famously going into Procter, going into Unilever recently, um, going 
today there was the news that, uh, well, today, maybe yesterday, that he wants to go into Disney as well. So what is the, what context makes this activist and Mr. come in and, and what do they do? Activist shoulders look at uh, a, 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 a quite small series of KPIs, which makes, uh, makes them uh, excited for a potential target company. So their, their financial performances KPIs as well as governance KPIs, these are the main ones. So from a, from a financial performance side, they look at uh, typically the market to book uh -huh. versus peers, versus competitors. So they will trace uh, the, the, the market to book performance of a company versus competitors. And they will, um, if a company which is underperforming, they will then they will then uh, go more into the details to see if there is a structural financial problem behind or not. Mm -hmm. So that's the first one. Market to book, they look at market to book, they look at return. What, what does market to book exactly? Market to book is the market cap divided by the book value. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, uh, to make it simple, they look at the, the, the market cap evolution. Oh, God. Okay. And, uh, and then they look at the return on asset, which is also a typical KPI, KPI they look at to see if there is, uh, if 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 uh, if this uh, if they look at the absolute value, but as well the evolution of it, the evolution of it, especially to decide when is the best moment to jump in. Mm -hmm. So from a financial perspective, these are the two main ones, and then they look at the governance itself. They look at the, if there are agency issues uh, at uh, at the board of directors. Agency issues mean if the board of directors is acting in a proper way, which means which means if the, the, the board of directors of directors is uh, defending the interests of the shareholders. Mm. And um, we will see later on that in some companies it was not the case. So these are the main KPIs they look at. And when they see that there is a sudden drop in performances, they, they consider the, the best moment to jump on the target, like a cat hiding itself behind a wall to jump to jump off on, on the mouse. Mm. So that's the, 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 I think, or uh, I like also using that that uh, that image, which is the pirates hiding themselves in the Caribbean uh, islands yeah. be, behind islands and uh, watching at the big Spanish galleon full of, full of gold <laughs> and uh, waiting for the best moment. To, uh, to attack. Pirates normally paid by the Queen of England, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and um, yeah, I'm a person that actually learns to play by doing. So maybe we can go over some key examples of like companies and consumer goods, because it's not only fast moving. You also men mentioned Luxottica, which is on the on the periphery, if you like, but it's still part of the market. So maybe you can go over some examples of when activist investors yeah. acted, how they acted, and, and, and what happened. I, I think there are, we, we can focus on two great examples uh, for the moment, which are Danone uh, as well as Nestle. So as I said already before, Danone has been confronted to its, its first uh, activist event in 2012, with Nelson Pelt, and in that case, I have to say it was soft, and it didn't last that much because it lasted only for six months, and at that time, the requests from Nelson Pelt were not very aggressive. It was not a very intensive as, a, as an activist event, which means that the impact uh, and the consequences for Danone were zero. Mm -hmm. So it didn't provoke any kind of changes to, towards Danone. Can you remember why he intervened at that time? Like what the context was of the company? Or... I think um, at that time, uh, Danone one was still under uh, a certain political uh, protections, protection from the government. Mm -hmm. And it was at that time hard to... To, 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 to be aggressive and to do intensive activism without any 
political consequences. Mm. So that was one of the reasons. And I think another reason is that Nelson Peltz as well, and he said that officially, had a, a gentleman agreement with Franck Ribou, mm -hmm. uh, who was the chairman and CEO of Danone at that time, to uh, to do not be too too aggressive. So there was a gentleman agreement between Nelson Peltz and Franck Ribou. And uh, Nelson Peltz, Nelson Peltz left uh, the, the shareholder, the, left uh, Danone as a shareholder six months after with a 12% uh, profit on, on, his, uh, on his investment. So uh, that was, I think, uh, enough for him to, to leave. Not bad, a 12% yeah. return in six months. So and then the second event from uh, at Danone was in 2017. Uh, uh, Corvex management also stepped in uh, as an as an activist, requesting some improvements uh, in terms of uh, financial performances and financial targets. But then, as well, the, 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 it didn't provoke uh, that much uh, to, to 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 Danone. Uh, due to the fact that again the, the the intensity of the activism was quite weak, as well as the credibility of the investor was not as Nelson Peltz or as uh, was not comparable to Third Point, for example. Yeah. So the, the credibility of that activist, the track record of that activist, was not comparable with the masters of that activist world. So again, in that in, in that activist event, uh, it didn't provoke that much towards Danone. But in, two, in, in 2021, the two major activist events uh, arrived towards Danone, and there the, the, the picture changed because uh, the intensity of uh, activism was much higher, which means that they have been extremely aggressive on requesting changes in terms of uh, governance, in terms of uh, management, and in terms of financial performances. So twice uh, in two months, uh, uh, so in January as well as in February in uh, in 2021, and uh, especially with artisan partners, the second one, the credibility and the track record of that activist helped and supported the fact that uh, changes had to occur in the mm. Yeah, I think maybe it's, it's important to take a step a step back on the side and maybe remind everyone that the CEO at Danone at the time was Emmanuel, Emmanuel Faber, Faber. Emmanuel Faber, who was chairman and the CEO at the same time. And uh, one of the first requests from the activists was to, to cut the two functions to, to separate the two functions, meaning that uh, Emmanuel Faber could not be at the same time chairman and, and, and CEO, uh, which after some weeks of negotiation uh, accepted to be. Uh, but according to the activists, it was not enough, and they even requested uh, Emmanuel Faber to, to, to leave the company. Yeah, and Emmanuel Faber was a guy, a CEO that was considered to be a visionary. He had Absolutely. a great, great PR, spoke a lot about social responsibility. So he, he was definitely a, a, a frontliner in, uh, on communicating on his G standards for, for Danone. Uh, and Danone is, the, it's part of the DNA of the company as well. Uh, if you, if you remember the, the speech of Antoine Ribou in 1972, as far as I remember, yeah. he always claimed, uh, that Danone should not be only a, a, a money making company, but also how Danone should have a positive impact on the society. So that was always part of the DNA of Danone. And that was definitely, uh, taken as well by, by Emmanuel Faber as one of the main claim, one of the main arguments of uh, managing the company of, for the last years. The problem is that in parallel, the, the financial performances of the note were not in line with the benchmark, not at all, and this for the last 10 to 12 years. And despite the fact that the image of the management uh, and the image of the company was in the 
and the math uh, extremely positive for uh, investors, Danone was not uh, best in class at all. So there is a moment uh, that the reality comes back and uh, the activists were requesting uh, the management to deliver the basics uh, of what they, what they expect from them, which is delivering financial performances at least uh, comparable to the benchmark. So uh, that was not the case of Danone. Uh, we will see if it if it's, uh, will be the case uh, now and in the future. And I have still some doubts about that, but we'll come back to that. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and since then, yeah, Manuel Faber left the company, uh, left in inverted commas, and now there's a new CEO, which... There is a new CEO, and um, one of the big points as well highlighted by the, the activists was that uh, there, there was an agency problem at... At, uh, at Danone. Which, which is one of the three legs, right? It's uh, absolutely. Cap, you have market cap, you have uh, return, return on assets cap. and governance uh, potential issues. And Danone is a, is a school case uh, regarding that topic because the company was definitely running with agency issues at least for the last 12 years. Yeah. Agency issue, which means that the board of directors was not balanced enough to defend the interest of the shareholders. Examples. What is uh, an example of agency issue in the known? For example, um, we have been highlighting uh, the fact that uh, directors at the known and even independent directors had conflict of interest with the company itself. So you cannot be called as an uh, independent director if you have conflict of interest with the company and with the management of, of the company. So that was the case for at least three members of, uh, of the board of directors. We have highlighted the fact that as well, uh, uh, some uh, directors at the board of Danone uh, also offered board um, positions to the management of Danone into their companies. For example, you had a director coming from Renault at the, at the board of directors of, of Danone, which is okay. But at the, on the other side, you had uh, Danone director at the board of Renault. So, which means that, okay, I, I monitor you, you monitor me. There's uh, not much independence there. There is, uh, it's not illegal, but the balance of uh, independence uh, at the board was not really optimum, yeah. I would say. So um, these are concrete examples. There, there are others uh, in the board of directors of Danone, like uh, many of them were also Danone or ex-Danone employees, which means that in a way they were uh, linked to the management of Danone yeah. uh, from uh, their career development, which could be, which is not optimum in terms of independence to monitor the performances of the CEO uh, and the CFO of the company. No. So, yeah. So that's why uh, the, 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 the the activists have also uh, figured out that there was an agency issue, and these are concrete examples. As a consequence of that, the new chairman of Danone, uh, Gilles Schnepp, has clearly uh, taken a decision on changing the composition of board of directors. This is one of the main actions he took at the, uh, at the beginning of his role, and uh, the ones who were not optimum in terms of independence, who had also conflicts of interest, were the first ones in leaving the board of directors. So uh, it's good at least that they have acknowledged that there was a problem 
and uh, they are uh, cleaning that that board of director table. And it takes time. You cannot do that in in six months. But uh, when there 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 are elections or when the mandates are finishing from these people, so they are not even asked to 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 renew. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, let's see how the non evolves in the next what year, two years, because it, they, if they don't do well, they risk being acquired. So, I mean, it's very important to 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 look at this uh, this G later out of ESG because there is a clear uh, scientific evidence out of the literature that there is a connection and a correlation between governance and financial performances, yeah. which means that when there is agency, when there are agency issues in a company, it leads almost automatically to lower uh, financial performances. We have, we, have, we have the example here clearly about Danone, but it's also uh, clear into the scientific literature. We are we are able to demonstrate that fact, and I'm able. Uh, I'm happy that the, the, as well that the Danone case is supporting the, the existing literature. Yeah, we have uh, in the other side the example of Nestlé, which okay. is a bit similar. Um, in 2017, uh, third point stepped in in uh, in the Nestlé as a Nestlé shareholder uh, with the 2.3 percent of the shares, as far as I remember. But with an extremely intensive and aggressive uh, approach, uh, doing press conferences, even building a special website dedicated to uh, uh, to, to shake uh, wow. Nestlé, yes, uh, and so really putting pressure on them, like change or your stock price will go down because we're doing a giving you super bad PR, no? With a, with a very good presentation on telling them what they have to do. Uh, you have to divest that type of business. You have to uh, acquire these companies. Uh, you claim that uh, your, uh, your company is uh, effective for this reason, this reason, and they say, no, no, they clearly said... Uh, uh, that uh, Nestlé is a bureaucratic uh, uh, company, etc. They were extremely aggressive, and um, in that case, uh, it worked in a way that it also highlighted the, uh, some agency problems at Nestlé, and I will come back to that. The, the, the funny thing is that Nestlé management never commented the declarations of that point. They never referred to the expectations of, of third point. Did they give them a seat on the board? No. No. They didn't. They asked for it. I am sure they, they did. They didn't get it. Um, and, but the thing is they, they, they almost realized all the points that the activist was requesting. Well, so they have uh, gone for more aggressive uh, targets in terms of financial performances. That was one of the points of, of, of the activists to have this case, so to, to be more aggressive in terms of EBIT margin and top line growth. So the, this have been uh, communicated even three months after the activist event. They have been uh, increasing uh, the, the, the share buybacks programs with huge numbers, 20 billion, 30 billion uh, share buybacks programs. They, um, they have been changing progressively the composition of the board of directors. Third point was claiming that there was no uh, directors outside Nestlé uh, with experience of the categories of, uh, of, uh, of Nestlé, yeah. which was correct. Uh, but they have uh, they have changed that. So they they, are, they brought on board people from uh, Zara, uh, Mr. Isla, uh, people from uh, uh, Harold, people from Adidas, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So people from a consumer expertise. There is only one point that they didn't do that was requested by the, the activists was to sell the shares of L'Oréal. 
So, you know, oh. let's be I still 20% of L'Oréal. Oh, 20% per law. And uh, this is the only one point left, I have to say. Um, Why would they want to sh- sell the shares in L'Oreal, considering that L'Oreal seems to be doing pretty well? I mean, that was to, of course, to increase the cash position of, of, right. of Nestlé and to uh, to give uh, to increase the return to us to us shareholders Got it. with uh, share buybacks with dividends, for example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, interesting. And now Nestlé is in a, in a strong position. So Nestlé like, also done quite a lot of M and A. Like they sold what's the name Calderma. They saw, they recently sold the meals business. They bought not that long ago. They bought Nature's Bounty's vitamins, for example. Correct. So. Um, Galderma was definitely in the list of uh, of, uh, of the activists to divest. So they they, they executed that uh, that uh, uh, that request. Um, so Nestlé has de- has definitely uh, how can I say that has improved its overall performances since the activist event. If you look at the, the, the stock evolution since uh, 2017, so there is a, a positive outcome out of this. If you look at the total shareholder return, there is a, a positive outcome since the activist event, which is not the case with Danone, with none of them. So none with the activist event of uh, 2012, no positive effect from the activist event of 2017, and no positive effect uh, from the financial performances on Danone since uh, the events of 2021. It's maybe a bit early still, but we are, I mean, we are, it's two years after. Yeah, we will look at the, 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 the financial statements of Danone, uh, which will be published in the next weeks, and I'm going to follow that in details. But for sure, from a, a, a total shareholder return perspective, yeah. It's not there, so yeah. there is no positive outcome uh, for the moment, or, uh, despite the, these two activist events which took place two years ago. Yeah, because you mentioned that Nestlé were given like very straightforward recommendations, quote unquote, from the activists. Was it the same case with Danone? And and have they? I mean, apart from getting rid of the CEO, have they done anything else? It was not as uh, precise. And as detailed as uh, third point with Nestlé, mm. I have to say that maybe also the, le- the level of intensity was maybe a bit lower. Uh, but it's clear that um, for the moment, the, the outcome is disappointing. Yeah. And I link that myself not only myself, but also with the support of the available academic uh, literature, that as long as the agency issues are not totally solved, the positive outcome uh, on the financial performances on the financial side will not be visible. Mm. So, uh, as I said already, there is a correlation between between agency issues and uh, financial performances. It's a work in progress at Danone, and uh, there is time between uh, between the execution of that and the, the the time we will see the the benefits of it. Yeah. And then, um, so with all this together, um, like of course they improve. Nestle's performance ultimately benefiting their shareholders. But for example, with Unilever, so, so Nelson Peltz has intervened in Unilever and a lot of uh, shareholders of the big shareholders, analysts and activists have kind of like a bit ridiculized um, Unilever's and then on social cause. Yeah. Um, really, like I think that Unilever, they, there's a quote of someone try, saying that they were trying to do social programs with mayonnaise, <laughs> for instance. Yeah. And I know that Favre's social activism was something that was kind of frowned upon. So ultimately, do you think that act, uh, activists 
good or bad for companies and maybe later we can even go into are they good or bad for societies as well yeah um i mean there is no yes or no answer on that. oh it depends <laughs> so um if you look at uh the the, the effect of uh third point at nestle overall we can definitely say that it has been positive for the company it has been positive because they have they have rebalanced their governance uh, uh their governance strategy and from a financial performances it uh, it is definitely positive um of course the esg uh, dimension is every time more important to everybody else agendas we will usually focus on e and s and we forget about the g yeah which that, is governance which is governance and in that case uh it's clear that the the, the governance uh, of of nestle has been positively impacted by the the activism of the point um in the case of danone if you look at the four activist events over the past 10 years it's definitely not positive in terms of financial performances so is that positive or not in that case it is not is it positive in terms of uh governance the first two were not positive at all because the issues were already there yeah the issues the agency issues were already there in 2012 they were already there in 2017 it has been um identified and highlighted in 2021 only but uh, it's work in progress so let's see how they are going to solve that uh i'm personally not optimistic mm -hmm. that they can solve that on a short notice but at least they are working on it mm -hmm. so um i have to say that for from then on if you ask me is it uh, positive uh is the activist event for the non-positive, I have to say for the moment, it's overall neutral. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so it's not always positive or, or negative. Yeah. It, it, it's a case-by-case -case discussion. Basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you think, and for society ultimately, because we have these companies saying that they want to change society, I have my own thoughts on that, because I think that that should be up to regulators and governments, why companies, but... I mean, if you consider that... ESG is very important for the society, which I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and it, it, due to the fact that activists are focusing on the, are mainly focusing on the G dimension, they usually they, 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 when they point out a problem in, in, in the G is to improve it. So is that positive for the society when an activist tries to improve the governance of a company i think in that sense yes yeah is that positive for the society that activists are aggressive from a from a total shareholder return expectations i have no answer for that to be honest yeah. so uh, i said i said already the average time that they are present in the, as shareholders is 18 months uh so they are expecting on average uh, uh an increase of uh total shareholder return uh during the time of 18 months is that good or bad for the society there i have no answer mm. uh, sometimes it, it uh, the literature also demonstrate that then it creates momentum a positive momentum to the company for uh, even for the years after uh the this 18 months we are yeah. talking about and in some cases that improves the total shoulder return for the first 18 months and mm -hmm. then right after the lemon has been pressed so much that the company goes into difficulties yeah so again there is no absolute answer on that it's a case by case uh discussion i have to say something the mm -hmm. Each activist event is different because the target company is different, but also because uh, the, the activist itself is different. Um, 
Yeah, like Nelson, is, like Nelson, sorry, Nelson Peltz is like a very particular exactly. playbook, so to speak. No? Exactly. So the expertise, the track record, the experience, the way of doing activism is specific to each uh, activist. Yeah. And um, so they are very different uh, way of, of, of looking at it. And there is no absolute answer on that. So many, many articles are asking the question, is uh, activists good or bad for the economy? You will find people answering no. You will find people answering yes with their arguments. Myself, my answer is it depends. Mm. It's a case by case story. Yeah, yeah, which is ultimately life is more about grays than blacks and white, right? Correct, right. correct. Um, and you mentioned before Luxotica as an industry, as a company that that has been a target of activists and investors. Yeah. Maybe we can talk about Luxotica, but also interested to know about what other industries are the next the next frontier. But if you like, we can talk about Luxotica as well. Yes, yes, I, I do believe that uh, the pharmaceutical industry will be targeted uh, sooner or later, but I would rather go for sooner or by, by activists. Um, I can even give some, uh, some uh, company names. I, I'm tracking several, several companies in different uh, sectors with the typical KPIs that the activists use. We have been uh, mentioning them. And when I see that uh, some of these KPIs are moving from uh, green to orange and from orange to red, uh, I identify that that company will be at risk for a potential activist attack. And some of these companies are in the pharmaceutical industry. And um, I'm definitely considering Novartis as a potential uh, company uh, for uh, being considered considered as a as a target for from uh, from activists. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, the pharmaceutical industry will be definitely part of the game for activists. That has been already the case in the in in, in, in the past years, but very limited. Mm -hmm. Bristol Myers Squibb has been okay. targeted, um, Valiant uh, almost 10 years ago as well, but that was not, uh, I would say, a mass phenomenon like we could have seen in the FMCG yeah. sector. In the F FMCG sector, there is no single company which can consider itself uh, protected from activism. Yeah, unless you're private. Unless you're private, obviously, but if you are stock listed, yeah, every company uh, is potentially under the threat of uh, of activism. That's why the ones which have not been attacked have created programs, internal programs to to do internal activism. So just to prevent uh, themselves against the potential attacks. So basically, they are anticipating potential requests from activists and putting in place strategies and actions that a potential activist would do to, as to say, look, the job has been done already, so yeah. you don't need to come. Yeah, which is, I think that the prime prime example and probably the first one, at least that comes to my mind, is what Paul Polman did with Unilever when, yeah. when, when exactly. 3G tried to acquire them. Exactly. Uh, he, he has even used uh, that that sentence that or that these words uh, after the the potential acquisition from uh, 3G Capital, I mean uh, Kraft Heinz, which which has failed, he said, "Now we are. In, we know that we are under potential uh, at, attacks from uh, from uh, other companies or from activists, and we are going to put in place uh, internal activism." And uh, Right after that, they have sold the margarine business to KKR, as far as I remember. So yeah. they have devastated the uh, non-strategic assets with a lot, with significant cash return. And uh, they have uh, put in place uh, share buyback pro programs. Right. Um, but that was not enough. That was not enough. And uh, we have seen that was not enough due to the, with the with the arrival of Nelson Pels last year. Exactly. Yeah. 
and that's already resulted with the CEO stepping down and another one coming in, right? Yeah, exact, exact, exact. But really, in uh, Unilever, we still need some time to really look at the, the potential effects. And uh, I'm going to dedicate myself to this one in the next, the next month. Well, that's the perfect excuse to invite you to this film. This was Ivan Cuesta. Hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as I did and learned a lot about the world of uh, shareholder investment. Interested to see how the next years will be on this front. Remember to show us your support if you haven't yet by sharing this podcast with your network, subscribing to it, and also following us on LinkedIn. As you know, we're very open to feedback, so please let us know. I'm very approachable uh, via LinkedIn or via email. Uh, you can find me at daniel at Thanks for listening again, and we'll see you in the next episode of the FMCG, guys. Bye.